Hello all you happy critical thinkers. This week I am reporting to you from my actual office on the campus of North Country Community College. I'm hoping the lighting is a little better and the glare off my glasses is a little less. Uh, and we'll see how this whole process goes. I'm using a different camera and a different setup and one of these days I'm going to get this down perfectly. But anyway, this week we are discussing Chapter 6, which is about evaluating sources of information. Because the world is uncertain, and many, if not most, of the questions we deal with in life are Type 3, conflicting system questions, there often are not enough actual facts on which to base a decision. So we sometimes need to use other people's opinions to help us form our own arguments for what to believe or what to do. The question is, who should we listen to? There are many experts out there, but how do we know which experts are trustworthy? It's a lot of work to determine the answers to this question, as you will see in Chapter 6. I can tell you that, quote unquote, leading scientists are not generally your best sources, if that is what you are being told, leading scientists. For example, a 10-year study by leading scientists has found that tough to toothpaste prevents decay in four out of five cases. If this sentence were followed by the leading scientist's names and the detail of details of the study, then maybe this would be a legitimate claim. However, if all we are told is leading scientists, then we are not being given a real argument, and this is called an appeal to false authority. This is one of the logical fallacies, which are problems in reasoning, that we'll be learning more about in Chapter 7. But as you probably know, it's pretty intuitive to know whether someone is, an act, is not an authority. However, it's not always as easy to figure out when someone is an authority. A problem occurs when someone is widely acknowledged to be an authority, but that person's integrity has been compromised, and people don't realize it. A few years ago, one of my students in English 101 wrote a research paper on treatments for bipolar disorder and found a lot of references to leading scientist Joseph Biederman from Harvard, who recommended certain medications in many cases, even for children as young as two years old. Digging a little deeper, my student found that this scientist's ethics have been questioned because his research is funded primarily by drug companies. It is not wrong or fallacious to quote this guy as an authority, since he is widely acknowledged as such in the field. However, because his research may be compromised, it might leave your argument open to being discredited, so you have to be very careful how you present it. To muddy the water further, I asked a psychiatrist I know what he thought of Biederman's research and possible conflict of interest. He noted that the research was funded by drug companies because they are the only ones funding that kind of research right now. Would we rather not have any research done on effective treatments for mental illness? Do you see why it's so difficult to know whom to trust? If you're interested in more about Biederman and the controversy, I've included a link. But you can also just Google him. On page 118, our text gives a great list of criteria to use in judging the authority of a particular source. You will, however, rarely find that all 12 criteria are met. Once again, you will have to be the arbiter of which criteria are most important in a particular case. God, you need critical thinking even just to do your critical thinking. Ah! It is good to be skeptical and weigh the pluses and minuses of a particular source's expertise, but as the text says on page 123, skepticism is not cynicism. I often find that students who take this course go through a cynical phase in which they don't trust anything anyone says. I suppose this is natural, because once you start to see that everyone has their own stake in the things they are saying, it's hard to imagine that any of them have your best interests, or even the interest of truth, at heart. Still, critical thinking should not be an excuse to harden your heart against the world, even though the world may leave you with a lot of disequilibrium when you don't know who to trust. Simply use your best judgment based on the tools you are learning this semester and have learned in other ways in your life, and be ready to change your mind if other information comes along. That is all we can do. 
The chapter contains a few links to different videos, which I highly recommend that you watch. Uh, one is my cousin Viz from my cousin Vinny. Uh, another is from A Few Good Men. And there is an ad from a Scandinavian energy company, and I have included the links to those videos in these notes. This week's assignments, which I stay, are to read Chapter 6, and for your discussion posting, pick any of the group discussion or critical thinking questions, as usual. Um, but I do want to note that if a particular box contains too many questions to analyze in 450 to 550 words, just pick a few you know, two, three, four, however many you can deal with effectively in that amount of space. Of course, read the responses to your postings in last week's discussion, and if desired, continue the conversation. The postings on this week's discussion page and post thoughtful responses to at least three. For next week, just so you know, we're going to be skipping to chapter 15, um, and we're also going to be watching a documentary on Frontline. Uh, PBS and you can access it online. So if you check out the f next week's notes you'll have all the information you need to access that documentary if you want to watch it in advance and um, I just wanted to give you the heads up on that. Otherwise things are pretty much as usual for next week. Anyway, have a wonderful week and let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>